and welcome back to the live series podcast brought to you by Amicus Recruitment. This is the podcast that gives you insight into the life and role of tech leaders from all over the world. Today I'm joined by the lovely Colm Ginty, data engineer over at 6.6. Thanks for joining me Colm, how are you doing? It's my pleasure, yeah I'm good thanks, I'm good, how are you? Yeah no I'm really good thank you. Um, we're recording this on a Monday so I think everybody's kind of got that Monday head on um, but I've been yeah, really looking forward so. to this. Uh, this episode so yeah let's dive straight in shall we um so like mm -hmm. i said you're, you're over at 6.6 um maybe for people that haven't heard of 6.6 do you maybe go through what they do and, and what your role is there as well yeah just just from a high level i guess um 6.6 .6 is a boutique uh, tech consultancy um building um software solutions for for a range of different clients um I'm not sure exactly how in depth I should go, so so I'll just leave it at that high level. Um, my own role is I'm a data engineer, part of the team building out data pipelines, moving data from A to B, and transforming it along way so that it's um, it's nice and um, tidy and uniform and adhering to a to a common schema that makes it easy to use at the uh, at its endpoint at the at the, at the data sync. Um, and we're doing all that um, in Kafka streams. Okay, wicked. I like that it's a bit, I think this is probably the first person I've had on that's used the phrase boutique tech. I'm not really like, you know, oh, yeah. that's not a phrase you hear too often, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Is that kind of something that your role at 6.6 .6 now, is that something that you always aim towards? Like walk me through kind of your career up to this point and any projects that you've worked on and to get you to where you are right now. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I started out about eight years ago um, as an engineer. Um, I joined uh, my employer then as, um, as a Java engineer without really knowing too much about what I was going to be working on. But it turned out that I was put on a project pretty quickly that was um, using what was then new and latest and greatest and very cool um, big data te technologies like Spark and Cassandra and Kafka. Um, to um, to to move data from uh, from an old legacy system, do some fancy stream processing, and um, put it into Cassandra, which is going to be our new big data uh, data store. Um, so that kind of I think I got quite lucky actually in that in that project to get experience with these what were then very cool, not that they're not cool anymore, but then they were very kind of exciting and new. Um, technologies um, and when I left that employer um, I said all of a sudden had a whole host of um, responsibility in my next role where um, I had some experience maybe two years of using these technologies I wasn't you know I wasn't like a your typical idea of a senior engineer but back then there wasn't anybody who had years and years of experience using these technologies so um, in this in this new place there was a team of us all about the same age with the same level of experience roughly and um we were told go and, and build uh big data solutions for us um, and we had sort of free reign to um to choose technologies choose design solutions um and uh, it was a lot of fun so that was about uh four or five years ago i think that was um at, at betson um but then that came to an end they had a, a new ceo came in didn't believe in data um and we were all moved out the door uh quite quickly um unfortunately but um still remember the the, the role with a lot of fondness um and then i did some contracting because again you know these these uh, technologies that i was using um not that many people had a lot of experience with them and they're very in demand. So I found that I was quite in demand. So I did some contracting um, in Manchester and in London, uh, took the opportunity to travel as well. Um, and I guess at this time I was just, I kind of, I wasn't think, thinking tremendously long-term. I was thinking in terms of, okay, I find myself in a nice position where I have uh, in demand skills. So I'll just make, I'll make the most of them for now. Um, I came back from traveling and I think um, at that time I was um, I was probably looking for a lead role 
I think that was something that I was, I was always interested in. I always thought I'd be good at, um, and I felt like the right time. So I took a role um, at Capita Consulting, uh, leading a small small team of data engineers with the idea of building out a, a data platform. Um, and enjoyed that initially. In the end, um, the environment wasn't very conducive to doing engineering. Um, and I left after 11 months, but really, really enjoyed the, um, the leadership aspect of that role. Um, it was very, I found it very fulfilling to kind of, because it's very powerful when you, when you provide people with, um, with leadership and good leadership, especially, obviously. Um, so I really enjoyed that and found it fulfilling, uh, but left after 11 months for, for various reasons. Um, and then came on to 6.6. .6, so I kind of, after Capita, I felt like I needed to go back to the tech, um, wanted to get to working with, with Kafka streams. Um, so took, took the role here. And that's, that's where I am. Um, and back to the original question of um, kind of, you know, what's been my goal and what's, what kind of goals have led me to here? My goal overall has ultimately been to to leave engineering which is what i'm doing at the minute i'm, I'm um, searching for a role inside engineering sitting between the technology and the the client and business side of things um but definitely i feel like the experience of working hands-on as an engineer has been very very powerful and i expect it to really stand to me in the future mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting because I remember when we spoke before, um, you said that you're kind of working in a, a remote kind of um, situation at the moment. Um, we'll come back to kind mm -hmm. of the things that you've learned sort of, um, in those leadership positions um, in a little bit, but I kind of want to speak obviously like in your current position, I know you said you're looking to move out of it. In terms of how things are currently functioning. How have you found kind of the difference in previous roles to, to now? I can't imagine that we're all completely remote like your current one is. So how does it, how does it compare and, and what kind of makes it, I know when we spoke before you said that the team that you're currently in works really, really well, um, like kind of as fully remote. So kind of what, what would you say makes a, a remote team tick and what makes it successful in that sense? Um, so I think it's, Something that's really key is I don't think you can be entirely remote. I think you need to meet up in person sometimes in the office. Um, sometimes just in terms of solving problems, being in the same room um, is really important. But for building that kind of sense of um, camaraderie and togetherness as a team, I think you have to you have to um, meet in person. Um, so I don't really believe in um, hundred percent remote teams you know maybe if everyone is super technically strong um and there's strong direction and leadership from from someone you know you can build good things but that team would be better i think if they met up in person uh, at least semi regularly um so i think that's i think that's the the most important thing to bear in mind i think when in the current environment where a lot of people are fully fully remote um, I don't really believe in it. I don't think it's optimal to, to have a fully remote team. Yeah, I think I'd probably agree with you, to be honest. I know at Amicus, we're functioning on a, on a hybrid model and you can kind of pick and choose which days you want to come in and it works for me. I think I'd, I'd prefer to be, have the option. I do like being in the office, but I think um, mm -hmm. having the option is, is really important. And like you said, having that kind of connection with people is completely different. I've worked in fully remote teams before and not really enjoyed it. Um, and so I think that I'm just having that kind of, it's, it's yeah. really basic, isn't it? But it's just human nature to need that kind of connection with people, I guess. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. What kind of tools do you use in your remote team just out of interest to, to connect with each other? Is it, what kind of channels are you using? Um, so we use Teams for, um, for instance, messaging. I've used you know, Slack in previous previous places. Um, sometimes you email people, not very, not very often. Um, it's mostly using Teams for messaging and, and um, calling. Um, and Slack actually, sorry, we're using Slack in 6.6 as well. Um, we use things like, um, I've used Miro before for kind of whiteboarding remote collaborative whiteboarding and um that was we found that very useful 
Um, that's kind of it. It's like the, the instant messaging and, and video calling tools are kind of, you know, obviously they're necessary and they, they keep things kind of ticking along. They're the oil, I think, that keeps the really remote teams uh, working well. Yeah, that was kind of going to be, you kind of segued me into sort of my next question of how oh, do you, um, how do you sort of build rapport with a remote team? I'm asking like obviously what tools specifically you use, but kind of on a personal level or, or a professional level as well, just building any kind of rapport and maintaining that yeah. relationship professionally and maybe personally as well with your colleagues. Is How easy is that to do for you and and how can maybe people in your position kind of keep that up as well? Yeah, so it's it's a good question. Um, so as, as I said, I think it's important to, to meet people in person, um, you know, in the office if you can. Ideally, you'd spend some time socialising outside of work to, to build that team culture. But if you can't, and you absolutely have to just collaborate remotely, um, I think it's just about taking some time on calls, you know, um, first of all, taking the time to call people, because I think it's easy, especially if you're an introvert, to just try and just message people and kind of have your headphones on and avoid human contact. But if you can uh, call people, if you can turn on the video um, and just take some time in each call to kind of you know ask how people are, you know, take some time to kind of take some interest in their life outside of outside of work. Um, doesn't take very long you know just a couple of minutes at the beginning of or end of, of a call and I think that's important um and then I think what's powerful as well is in group calls you know in your stand-ups or your retros or whatever to um you know it doesn't have to all be business take some time to to have a laugh as well um I think that goes a long way yeah I would agree as well um I think the small talk is kind of the bane of some people's lives, especially introverts. It, but is. it is important, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And especially, I think I saw, I was, I was looking forward to asking you that question because I think I saw on LinkedIn today, I'm probably going to date this episode by saying mm -hmm. this, but there was a trending article about kind of, um, should introversy kind of be in, involved and, and discussed more when it comes to kind of diversity and inclusion in companies? And I think that's, that. Mm -hmm. kind of, do you, would you agree in saying that that is maybe something even more to think about in tech because potentially, you know, kind of, I mean, stereotypically I'm saying kind of developers and engineers can tend to be more on the introverted side. So would you agree and say that, mm -hmm. that, was, that is something that should be more considered when from a managerial perspective, but also kind of from a, a just an on all on one level for the team to kind of introduce mm -hmm. more thought into how to deal with introverts? Yeah, again, I think that's a really good question because, you know, it's something that everyone is aware of in, you know, in, in this business. So, like everyone knows that a lot of um, engineers and kind of techies in general are, are introverted, but more so are kind of, um, how to phrase it, like not people-oriented because I think that they're two different things, being introverted and being people-oriented. Um, and... If we accept, as as I think, as I do, that um, it's important to build a a collaborative, um, inclusive, fun culture in a team, um, then you need to think about how to involve those those people who kind of not like just don't want to be get involved in the banter at all, don't want to. Um, have to speak to people if they can help it um because you know that's that's them that's their personality and um it's that's perfectly great and oftentimes those people are, are really good engineers um and contribute a huge amount to the team mm -hmm. um but if we can also make them feel excited about getting involved in the culture of the team i think that would be very powerful um how to do that i'm not sure because i think a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about how to do it mm -hmm. um but it's definitely a good question. And if there is a solution to it, then um, I find that very interesting. Yeah, I'd agree as well. I think it's an interesting read on LinkedIn. I'll see if I can stick a link to it in the, in the comments or something. Hmm. But um, I think, again, kind of segued me really nicely into my next question of, of how involved should a lead or a manager be involved 
when it does come to kind of picking up morale or including people, because it's kind of the job to do that. But when it comes to introverts, mm-hmm. for example, um, and uh, and that job is actually maybe a little bit trickier than it would be with other members of the team. How involved would you say mm-hmm. a manager should be before it, it's kind of a little bit uncomfortable? Or you know, what I'm, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's kind of hard to phrase it. Yeah, like yeah, there is a great yeah. area there for sure. that. And, and from a managerial mm-hmm. perspective, I can imagine that being a little bit tricky. Yeah. Um, so I think, first of all, I do think it's it's part of a manager's responsibility. Like it's their responsibility to to drive the team culture and to um, make sure that everyone in the team feels um, feels at least okay about being in the team. Um, so yeah, so there are these people you often often in the team who are kind of you know very introverted and not really keen on getting involved in all the team culture stuff um as I mentioned like that's perfectly okay so um I think it's the manager's job to to reach out to that that person every now and again and just make sure that they're they're okay they're not getting frustrated they're not feeling forced into joining organized fun that um making sure that they feel that they know they're welcome to whenever they want to join in but if they don't want to that's perfectly fine because just it's not right to to force people to engage in ways that they don't want to um so i guess yeah my answer is it is the manager's responsibility and if they can it's um i think it's i think it's on them to proactively reach out to these people and take into account people's different personalities and different different needs in, in work i'm not saying it's easy um um but i think they have to try and do their best and do their best to learn about the people on their team about what their needs are yeah i think that's a really good shout especially about like that phrase organized fun i feel like that's something that is quite prominent with especially with remote working as well like i think yeah and but i suppose like as an example you could have situations where there's a social being organized or something and someone that just doesn't fancy it can just choose to work from home that day and they're not kind of you know they're not involved but that's their choice almost and there's not a lot of manager mm-hmm. can do about that sort of thing and and it's yeah it's just getting that approach right isn't it so when you kind of say well don't, you know we kind of want you yeah. to be involved or if you don't want to that's fine and, and I think yeah there is still a little bit of a gray area with that so it's an interesting subject to bring up and I like to talk mm-hmm. about that because everyone's got a different stance on it as well um yeah yeah <clears throat> So just to go back to um, what you said earlier about um, one of your other recent roles um, leading, I know when we spoke about that a little bit before, you said that you were mentoring some junior engineers on that team. Um, Mm -hmm. I just kind of want to like generally dive into that um, and kind of go over things that you kind of learned. I know it sounds like a super obvious question, but like what did that teach you and have you applied that sort of thing to what you do now? Um, And and is it something that have have you... the, the reason that I ask is because a lot of people listening to this um, or watching this will, will be people that kind of want to go into that role. Um, mm-hmm. So hearing about what you've learned and the kind of do's and don'ts of, of what you maybe didn't know before you were mentoring versus what you know now yeah. once you've mentored. Um, mm-hmm. that was a, I went really around the houses trying to phrase that. Yeah, no, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you get the gist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so what, so what did I learn? Um, I think if you're a senior and you're put in charge of um, mentoring people that are, you know, possibly much less experienced, um, it might be grads, for example, um, it's easy to become um, impatient. Um, you know, because. Not, not so much being impatient with um, people not knowing how to do things that you know how to do. Like, I think that's relatively easy to deal with. But dealing with people who maybe are kind of have a lot of confidence in themselves, maybe more than their experience uh, merits and are very kind of outspoken about what how things should be done. Um, I found that a little bit challenging and found myself getting um, frustrated and things, things like that. Um, but then there's a kind of two sides to that where a kind of uh, dealing with that sort of cockiness 
Um, and you, know, you don't want to shut it down too much because confidence is great. You want to encourage them, um, but you still want to set boundaries. Um, but B, recognize that on the other side of that cockiness is um, insecurity and to, to recognize that as well. So it's, you know, it can be easy to shut down somebody and say, no, look, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> you don't know as much as you think you do. Maybe listen to me. Uh, we can, I think sometimes I came across too harshly. I wasn't kind of, um, didn't take enough care to, to be gentle with, with those people at the same time. Um, so that was something new. I learned from the experience um, that I wasn't prepared for, I think, and didn't didn't expect to come as part of the, the, the deal. Um, yeah, I think that was the main thing. Um, apart from that, uh, um, I kind of, I think I learned the, the value of, of leadership, as I mentioned before, how fulfilling I found it. I really learned the value of providing leadership beyond, you know, just telling people how to do things, you know, that, that, that's how you should write the code, that's how we should deploy this and that, like this is the architecture we should, we should use, etc. You know, there's so much more to leadership in terms of um, supporting people emotionally, uh, providing direction, um, supporting your team against other parts of the business who try and encroach on them in ways they shouldn't. Um, that's all super important um, and very, very powerful. And seeing how powerful it was, was was very fulfilling as I mentioned. What what kind of ratio would you say um, would be kind of emotional support versus actually being hands on and keeping things ticking with the tech um, as a manager? It's a good question. So go on. Um, yeah, the emotional stuff is what sticks in my head. Um, it's more prominent in my head, um, probably because it uh, it struck me more. You know, I, I, I expected, obviously expected to be kind of providing technical support, but the, um, the emotional support side you know, did strike me more powerfully. Um, but perhaps in reality, that was just, you know, every couple of days I had to kind of take that into account and take action about it. Whereas, you know, every day, all day you're doing technical stuff. Um, so maybe in reality it's 20 percent of your time but it's in terms of its impact on the team i think it's it's more powerful than that yeah it's a really interesting stance isn't it i think that might be a question that i'm going to start asking everybody because i think when you touched on <laughs> that, I just thought a little light bulb went off it wasn't one of the questions i had prepared but i thought it is an interesting thing to kind of think of because mm. i guess not even in tech across the board um, any management style is going to be different, but there's always that emotional support that is a massive part of, of leading any team. Yeah. But maybe in tech, yeah, yeah. And there's, there's more kind of um, maybe deep focus time or maybe there's, there's kind of mm -hmm. periods of, of less interaction. How often are you actually, you know, having to yeah. be kind of the emotional support? Is it more or less? I think it's a really good point. Um, so totally. again, like the, this, this episode's just kind of flown really beautifully through um, oh, good. the topic, um, but I've just got one kind of last question to round it off with, and it's, mm -hmm. it's one that I do ask everybody, um, um, and it's quite a general one, but what kind of advice would you have for anybody looking to be in a similar position or to have had the experience that you've had? Um, so I think it's, this is kind of a cliched answer. Um, you probably get it from a lot of people who you interview, but um, to take um, take um, interest in your personal growth. You know, so you start out as an engineer. You're um, you're whatever at a university at twenty two. You know something. Then over the next five or six years, you learn a lot. Um, and then you become a tech lead because you're really good technically, but maybe you haven't, you're not prepared emotionally um, to lead people. Uh, maybe you haven't developed maturity you need to lead people. Maybe you haven't developed people skills. That's uh, really important. Um, so those things are all you know, necessary to be a good leader. Um, and I think people, most people are aware of that. And when they're looking for somebody to lead a team 
um, technical chops are necessary, but these other things are necessary as well. Um, so not to neglect those things, not to neglect um, personal growth in those areas. Um, what else? The other thing is, so I was, as I mentioned, I think I was very lucky getting experience with um, with these big data technologies back when they were new, and that really stood to me. Um, but anybody can, you know, take note of what's of the way the, the industry is going. What what um, kind of tech is is going to grow? Going to be hot? To use a use a cliche term, um, and you know, you can you can guide your your career in that direction if you want. It just means you're going to have to interview a lot, probably, if you haven't got direct experience already. But you know, if you think that cyber is going to be really huge over the next five, ten years, and there's going to be uh, great career opportunities there, then you know, learn some skills in your spare time and interview for, for cyber positions, and you can really kind of turbocharge your career. Yeah, brilliant advice. But I think you'd be surprised actually how little it does come up that people say that personal growth is, is a priority. I think a lot of people kind of okay. have that kind of um, external outlook on things of like, how, how do I help other people and support other people, which is right. As a manager, it's what you should be thinking, but personal growth maybe can get forgotten. So I think that's mm -hmm. really good advice. Yeah, yeah. Um, Colm, it's been absolutely lovely having you yeah. on. Um, some really, really insightful stuff. Um, just got to get my little spiel out of the way. Um, and so if you are watching on YouTube, yeah, yeah, of course. You, can, uh, <laughs> you can hover over the logo in the bottom corner and hit subscribe, uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok for updates, head over to our website amicusjobs.com for tech news, webinars, blogs, and keep up to date on the latest Python, Golang and JavaScript roles all over the globe. And I'll leave a, a little, uh, a couple of links there as well, stuff that we've mentioned in articles and things and anything that Colm recommends because he's very full of wisdom and I'm sure he's got lots of other recommendations and reading materials for everybody to have a look at. So um, Colm, thanks again, honestly, we'll definitely get you back on. I'm, I'm sure um, whatever you've got coming up in the future is going to be really interesting. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. A pleasure. Thanks. Mm -hmm.